Oh. Thanks for joining today. We might be talking about the most boring thing, data, but that's not real because data is tied to money. So really, you should be paying attention today because we got three guests up here who are going to tell you a lot about data and money and how it works and where this is all going in the next two years. TVL, that's everyone. Everyone was talking about that in 2020. Total volume locked for DeFi applications. I remember in early 2020 when Compound and a few other DeFi protocols broke past 1 billion in total volume locked. That was a big deal for the DeFi community. Now, three years later, no one really cares about TVL that much. Why? Well, because there's a lot of broken metrics in crypto, including market cap, active addresses, TVL, the list goes on. So that's what our topic today is going to be about. First, we're going to start off talking about interchain, though. And that's where everything in crypto is going. So we have to understand uh, interchain first before we can talk about metrics. We're going to start off talking about interchain as a definition, however, because that itself is a little problematic. Mariana, we're going to start with you. Talk about interchain and how you guys define it. Yeah. Um, so to my mind, interchain data is simply the manifestation of you know, cross-chain cross communications, you know, communication across different blockchains. Um, so we've heard about this very popular um, use case today uh, a bunch of times. You have um, token X and you want to move it from chain A to chain B. Now, how and where this data manifests itself depends on where you're standing on the interoperability stack. And so if you're on the application layer, um, this means exchange of messages, right? Um, whereas, you know, we at Metrica, we have, like, um, historically at least, we have been more focused on the lower layers of the stack, uh, which is, and I'll borrow a couple of terms that uh, from Sergey's uh, latest blog, we are mostly focused on the trust layer, the validation layer, and the um, transport layer. And so when I think about interchain data, I think about things such as um, validation of cross-chain events, uh, routing, um, what else? Um, yeah, the types, the types of things that typically the application layer is unaware of, which means uh, then exchange of messages. Um, so yeah, this is it's, it's a bit of a bottom-up definition, I would say. Not a, I don't know if anyone everyone agrees, and maybe a little bit skewed from um, because of my familiarity with Axelar. But yeah, this is kind of my take. No, that's why we're defining things, right? Because everyone comes from a different position, and that informs how you do your metrics, and that informs the people who are using your protocol or your product itself. Eric, same question over to you. Let's define interchain before we toss over to Dave with the hotball question about what the hell is after TVL. Uh, Eric, first, interchain? Yeah, interchain is, so I guess first we had multi-chain, which is, you know, launch on, launch on chain A, move assets to chain B, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it seemed like everybody was fighting for attention, but now as we some of the discussed on the previous panel, there's, there's application chains. What you're seeing is interchain is more launch here, move assets, everything is, in, is, is correlated and everything, um, everything is just, it, it works with each other. Everything is interoperable on each other. A lot of the, a lot of the tools, a lot of the infrastructure. So when I think of in, interchain, I think it's more look, instead of looking at individual blockchains, it's looking at the whole ecosystem and seeing how all of these assets will play together across uh, different protocols and different t pieces of infrastructure. Okay, love it. Dave, let's go to the question at hand. What's after TVL? What should everyone in this crowd, if, if you're trying to tell them what's next, what are we looking for a metric? No pressure. Okay. No pressure at all. <clears throat> well, let's first talk about the, the failure of TVL. Um, we, all, we all got bought into this metric uh, that was easy to game um, and one that didn't teach us much about whether anything was actually healthy or behaving effectively within the ecosystem. So as people bought into it, they realized it didn't, it didn't help us understand what we could do with a specific blockchain or protocol. Um, where we're sort of heading towards is what is a much more traditional uh, worldview which is what matters to most ecosystems, whether it's uh, blockchain or whether it's Web2 or anything else, are things like acquisition. Mm -hmm. So uh, how many customers are joining a specific blockchain? Retention, how long do they stick around? What do they do when they're there? And then traditional sort of behaviors of buying metrics. Uh, how many transactions are they running? Uh, how frequently are those, tr those transactions happening? So you're going to see, I think, two next phases. You're gonna, you are going to see some very blockchain-specific uh, metrics that do matter. They're probably a little more niche. So MEV, 
or uh, P&L for liquidity providers. They're very sophisticated just for those things. But then you're going to see um, many more people start to focus on traditional metrics that have made many industries grow over the years. Um, so think acquisition, retention, frequency of purchase. Those are the things that you're going to start seeing. The, the three R's, reach retention. Three R's. The reach Can retention revenue, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree, I agree 100%. Eric, let's keep going with you because before we had this conversation on stage, we were sitting right over there talking about some charts that you put together, yeah. talking about TVL and going through like, you know, TVL is not necessarily dead. We just need to think about it a little bit differently. Um, we were talking about active addresses, which crypto that obviously went through a very similar story arc, right? Where it was like active addresses with everything and now it's absolutely nothing and we don't want to talk about it, but everything has a little nuance in it, right? There's an asterisk on everything. So tell me about your perspective for this whole conversation. I think TVL has always been a bad metric. You could, I, I was looking at a bunch of blockchains. So we have a database, Covalent is a database. We have, I think, 75 plus blockchains now. Um, and I, I broke them down and there is one blockchain, which we'll name nameless, but has a market cap of almost $200 million and has less than 500 monthly active users. And by monthly active users, I mean have signed into their wallet and have sent something. So I did the math and I'm like, let's break this down. So this means if you break down the market cap, by each user, it means each user who is active on that chain is worth $165,000 because they logged in once and did one activity, which was not receive, it was send something. And I'm like, this is a, this is a great metric in the fact that it proves how inefficient the market is. But it, it's just like we've gone a long way to go to find different metrics that we can compare. And I think this compares to the, on a protocol by protocol basis, right? Some blockchains have more interesting metrics than others. Like as an, another example, uh, I looked at Moonbeam and I looked at Ronin. So like Moonbeam has almost 500,000. Moonbeam, if you don't know, it's a Polkadot EVM, um, has almost 500,000 monthly active users, but only 130,000 transactions over the course of the last 30 days. But then I looked at Ronin, has 130,000 active users and over and almost 500,000 transactions. So I'm like, what is the best metric? I think it depends. If you're looking at Ronin, Ronin is a game. Axie is pretty, is pretty much the main thing on that chain. You would probably say monthly active users and probably amount of people who've signed their wallets or have done an activity, earned an NFT or something. If you're looking at Moonbeam, it's a multipurpose blockchain, so who knows what it is, right? They need, it's up, I think it's up to the, the dApps themselves and the blockchains to define what those metrics are, opposed to us as a community just looking and saying, well, TVL is the best one, because I think TVL is just a bad metric, because we've already seen with one chain where each person is $165,000 is not the real world. Doesn't mean any sign of adoption. Marianne, I want to go to you in a second, but I want to ask a little more to get some more clarification here. I almost thought of Bitcoin when you were talking about a, a chain there that had no active users but had a high market cap, right? Because Oof. there's not necessarily a got, lot going on there in terms of people sending transactions back and forth, but it still has a high market cap. Yep. And you still have active addresses that you'd say have value. So when you're breaking things down a little bit more granularly, maybe it's with like some of these networks that obviously are kind of ghost towns, but maybe not. Maybe they do have some value and there's not a lot of people using it at this point. So how do you think about it when you get into the more like nuanced conversation? I think that's where you have to sit down because I, I can share this chart. It was really interesting. We all looked at it. And ETH isn't even in the ballpark. Each active ETH address, I can't remember what it was. Like I, I don't have it put in front of me, but it was something like, $18,000 if you look at the TVL versus the amount of person who sent it. So that to me still also seems outrageous, but we look at ETH very differently than we look at a lot of other things. So I don't have a good answer. I think it's, it's subjective to the chain. And if a chain would look at this and say, you know, we only have 500 people, but we value each one of those 500 people and we believe they're worth $200,000 $200, and then that's a good metric for them. They would just have to justify that to everybody else, I think is the the realistic thing to do. Like there's um, a PR agency and they said this, they said they had a client where they had, the person who wanted to be featured in a, uh, a news journal that only had 50 readers monthly. And that's all they cared about. They're like the one client just wanted to be featured in that one thing. And I think there's nothing wrong with that if you know what you want. That's what you're looking for. Love that. <laughs> it's a good story. I'm just, I just want to push on this a tiny bit. If yeah. I could. Any, any chain that has 500 users with a $200 million market cap. Is inefficient. I'm not a discreet. Not inefficient. It's, it's why Gensler is around. Yeah. Okay. That is not good for our industry. Like we have to stop propping these things up. Focus on places where people are having real transactions, et cetera. Like that, like this is not good. Like yeah. there are lots of reasons that's happening. They're not the reasons we're all here building. Um, I hope. I hope that's not the reason. Any thought on that, Mariana? <laughs> um, not on the particular comment. Um, I'm coming in from a slightly different angle, I think. Um, TVL and market caps have never been, historically at least, a core metric of ours, and not just out of ignorance or arrogance, by no means, um, but just because I don't think they tell the whole story. Like, 
right? So this is about interchain communications, right? And so if, if nothing else, what they do is they add one more dimension to the mix. And so how do, can you use TVL to capture the nuances of the underlying protocols like Axela or, 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 or its competitors and the risks that this entail, right? So, um, so to me, I think there's not going to be one metric that will rule them all in the interchain age, but uh, it will likely be uh, a variety of metrics under the umbrella of um, seamless continuity of critical services. Again, my angle is operations here, right? Um, so I, I think about things such as um, have the, you know, the cross-chain transfers been successful? Have all the steps uh, been taken uh, in the process? Have there been any vulnerabilities? Uh, these are the types of things that I'm thinking about when we talk about interchain data. So um, maybe to give you a real time example, a real life example, uh, if you go onto our platform or if you go onto Axelor Scan, and I'll go back to maybe the trust layer that we talked about before uh, this morning. So you'll see their metrics in Axelor, but just to give a bit of context for those of you that might not be familiar with how it works. Um, there's, you know, you have the battle, t validators have, um, are running battle tested delegated proof of stake. And they participate in this advanced multi party cryptography protocols, right? And so, in this context, we track a variety of metrics to capture the success of the validation layer. And so, with that in mind, I don't think it's going to be one metric by no means. And I think it's, it's most. It's, it's more important to focus on reliability and quality of service um, in this you know, new uh, era uh, rather than TVL and market caps. Yeah, that's so I want to come back to you because the, the main thing at hand here, I think, is that like, DeFi Pulse really captured people's imaginations with TVL, right? Like That's where everyone was checking in 2020, 2021. Is comp going up? Is the TVL going up, right? So that really captured I don't want to say retail, but sort of retail's imagination. And I think the fear is the next cycle, similar thing happens, right? But it's a different metric that's just as misleading and just as abused by every project out there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to get like what you guys think it's going to be and maybe like what you guys want it to be, if, if, if you for like fall on my, my tread there. Eric, it looks like three you R's, three R's. Reach, yeah, it's, it's the three R's. I, I, it's reach, retention, revenue is what everybody should be looking at. Like those are the three fundamentals of business and I think they'll play out in network dynamics as well. Um, you're gonna wanna see people building real products that have real utility with real usage, driving real adoption, not things that are hacked together uh, that have a shelf life because based on whatever APY is given out. Like I saw a DeFi protocol that like with Ohm, what was Ohm's APY, what was, what was it? It was something absolutely insane. <laughs> like the TVL they got because they were, it was like 2000, percent APY interest. I don't remember what it was. It, it, it was it was so ridiculous, but I was like, this is a bad metric and this is not doomed. This is this is not going to end, end well at all for anybody. Um, I don't I think it's it's going to be up to each team who's 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 building something and it's got to be looking at it from a more web two lens of fundamentals adoption and getting people to actually care and use your product, use your service or fall in love with what you're doing. Um, I think that's 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 really it. Like I, I I pulled this stat recently where there there are actually more NFTs that have been minted than there are websites on the internet. That's that's a fact. This is this is this is a hard fact. There are more NFTs that exist than websites. Think about that. And so when I thought about that, I was like, how many graveyards? How many? How many people, you know, got into a, a mint and like thought everything was going to be the future and all these celebrity endorsements? And I'm like, they're all fly by night things that just battle test the technology, but don't prove any of the long term fundamentals that anything is viable. It's, it's just it's just quick ins and outs. So I think anybody that figures out anything that's long term and viable is what we're really looking for, and not for any of these metrics that can be gamed really quickly. Because like TVL can be gamed, Discord users can be gamed. Anything that can easily be gamed, it shouldn't be looked at as a good metric. So. Um Maybe I know what you're pushing for here, so we'll we'll, we'll do an attempt. Thank um, you. So take like Squid, which just launched Squid. That Squid maybe in here somewhere. Uh, in the since Squid launched in January, 2,000 users, 1.2 million in transactions. Very factual and understanding yep. of how many people are joining, what they're doing. Now you're going to want to watch how many of those users stick around. One metric you might drive is revenue per user, and see how that uh, you know that's a pretty obvious metric we probably all use and our businesses every day. So 
Um, you watch how that variable changes. Can you get more revenue per user? Can you grow the user base faster? All those things will indicate whether that's going to be a viable project for the long term. Any follow-up thoughts, Mariana? Um, I would say maybe success ratio of transactions, end-to-end -end finality. How long does it take for my transaction to go through? Um, if we're talking about end-to-chain uh, solutions, what sort of chain coverage do you, do you support? Uh, if I'm a developer, I want to be able to tap into the various chains and the various assets. Um, yeah, this is kind of the... No, that's great because yeah. that spurs a, a whole other point. I'm just going to pass it right back to you. When we think of the interchain land, we're thinking of multiple different blockchains speaking to one another. And within those blockchains, there's bridges. There's bridges of vulnerabilities. There's lots of problems there, right? And then every chain has its different... Uh, consensus mechanism has its different purpose, different engines, there's different developers working on it, there's different tokens. You guys have the thankless job of making all this data make sense to people, right? Whether users, investors, or in between, whoever's using your website to understand this data. How do you guys piece that together? How do you piece all these blockchains that are now speaking to each other into metrics that are useful? So for example, if I'm talking about Bitcoin, talking about Bitcoin trading between two different Bitcoin wallets, not a lot of velocity there. But if I put Bitcoin into Ethereum, a lot higher velocity, right? Because I'm probably aping a few things, moving around more. The average user is maybe not going to understand that. But how do you guys, as data providers, do that in a responsible way and, and show that off from a website front, from a product front, or maybe even from a metric front? Any takers on that? Eric, I'll throw it to you first. Um, I think it's contextual with how we build our stack. So when we look at a blockchain, we take all data. So every wallet, every state transition, every transaction, every NFT, and we put it in a database and we normalize the data. Our job or our goal is just to make it easy for people to access and extract that data and make useful whatever they want to do. So we're not in the business of building, we don't build UIs, we don't build anything, we're, we're a read-only API. The, how we see this is how can we just Every time we hear of a crazy new use case, how do we optimize our APIs or our database to be able to solve for this use case? And that's really how we're looking at it. It's, it's, I, I, I think we've passed the point of it'll be one or two blockchains. I think, it's a, uh, I th I think it'll be an omni-chain future. I think everything, interoperability is obviously key and it's gonna happen. So it's like making sure that once the data's in there, it's normalized, standardized endpoints and make it easy and accessible for people to do whatever they want with it. Um. I think I understand the question. I'll, I'll give you what, what I think is the answer. Um, so uh, I think most, um, most developers, people who are trying to build using data, um, want specialized tables of some sort, so gold tables, making all the data consistent that they can use easily. <clears throat> I think the second most important thing is for those um, tables to be updated at the pace that chains evolve. Yep. And so the consistency is probably less about getting it right the first time and more about as the chains um, and the protocols adapt, being able to keep up with those. Um, the last, probably the thing that's we're all um, sort of um, is going to help all of us do what we do is you're starting to see the marrying of cloud and blockchain data. So what's made some of what blockchain data very complex is piping it out and ETLing it and maintaining it is very complex, costly, time-consuming, AWS, all that sort of stuff. Um, all of our data is kept in Snowflake. We just made that publicly available so people can access it through Snowflake because of that capability to access that data at a pace um, and a quantity that allows people to do a lot more things with it. So I think you're going to see this cloud matching start to create the consistency people need. Yeah. I, I'll add on to that. I, I would 100% agree. I, you're starting to see some of the larger players who have these sophisticated, uh, they have processes, they have ways they need to get the data, they have places they need to manipulate and use the data, and you're starting to see a lot of these people start to creep into the space slowly. Um, and they have data standards, and they have things that they need, and they have pipeline standards, they have uptime, they have SLAs. And so when you see them trying to figure out how to take all this Web3 data that exists and put it into these, um, these infrastructure pieces, I think that's sort of, yeah, exactly where it's going. Totally agree. Yeah, I have a, a slightly different thought that's about correlation. You, you know, we, uh, so recently we have seen an increasing amount of um, high quality data coming out of our space and uh, uh, very sophisticated tools, um, analytical tools, right? Um, so how do you make sense of the data? So a lot of what we think, uh, at Metrica at least, is how do we correlate them to make it 
you know, useful to, to users, to investors, etc. So even in the early days of our um, platform, what we were thinking about is, so if I, if I tell you um, a KPI that only sort of describes your infrastructure, right, your own individual setup, what does that mean? Unless you, you correlate that to what happens in the network, that's not useful, right? So if I'm, I'm not performing well, what, what does it mean? I need to compare myself to, to, to the network. So correlation matters. And so then the next level of that is uh, correlating off-chain and on-chain data, right? Um, an example of, I mean, there are all sorts of permutations of you know, off-chain and on-chain data um, combinations, but um, an example, again, from our platform is when we um, sort of leverage system-level metrics and correlate that to, to on-chain data. And then the next level after that is applying machine learning, intelligent tools to leverage your historical data to make predictions, to, you know, to spot anomalies um, and patterns in your, in your data. So. Love it. Yeah, most data is off-chain, right? Uh, it's happening on Binance's order book. So let's go to the last question. We have about six minutes left. Dave, I'm going to start with you on this one, then we'll work our way back and give uh, Mariana the last word for the session. Are data providers getting smarter, or are they following the herd? Because we have seen market cap, active addresses, TVL, and we often see data providers provide that, right? Because that's where the SEO juice is. You want people to use your platform. Doesn't necessarily mean that like these data providers are bringing like, the best metrics to the table. So. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg question, but I'll throw it over to you. Where are we at with that? Yeah. Um, I don't know if smarter is, <clears throat> smarter is the right question. Like, the, the fundamental issue with getting to blockchain data has been, in essence, pulling it off the chain, cleaning it, curating it, making it available. All of that part of the sort of history is now sort of behind us. Um, al almost any data provider worth their salt is capable of working with nodes, getting what they need, putting it to market. Um, the smarter is actually in the hands of people who use that data. What do you use that to do? And so you have folks who might need an API to build products, and you have uh, individuals in the community who need to understand the protocols that they're working with, and so they need insights built in real time. <clears throat> so it's more about, is the market able to ingest this information more cleanly? I think you're seeing data providers who sort of weren't, weren't able to exist in cleaning data from nodes sort of fall away. And the ones that sort of have figured out how to access what I would consider a relative commodity at this point and do something well with it for the market, they're just helping the market succeed more efficiently. Eric? Oh, this is such a good explanation. Um, I'll see if I add on to that. Uh, yeah, I think for us, I, I can speak for us specifically, for Covalent, it's more about you want to always catch narrative because catching a bit of narrative will get you users. But at the same time, from you have integrity with what narratives you capture, right? Uh, you don't want to be chasing things that you just don't believe in or things that don't add value. And sometimes it's more when you're thinking of catching narrative, what are the things that are interesting and what can we actually expose, right? More about speaking factually than taking opinions and just saying, here's the charts. This is factually what it is make up your mind with, 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 with how, what you want to do with this data. And that's how we look at it. But for the most part, it really is just empowering developers and empowering analysts and empowering people who need the data to build whatever they want and then come back to us and say, hey, this is what I've got. This is what I've done with your data. And we say, that's cool. <laughs> Love it. Mariana? Yeah, I think I really agree with your description. Yeah, it's how, how, how do you make your insights actionable depending on the audience that you have? Um, yeah, and definitely our tools and our solutions are getting smarter and smarter, yeah. Awesome. Well, we actually have about two minutes left, so bonus question for me. Oh. <laughs> Dave, it's coming to you because you smiled. Uh, let's talk about off-chain data a little bit more. Ariana, you brought that up a second ago. Most data is off-chain, right? So how, as an on-chain data provider or someone who's looking at mostly at on-chain data, do you make that available to people, and yeah. how do you synthesize that or correlate it, as Mariana put it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, 
the, qu the first question is, what do you need your off-chain data to do with your on-chain data? So let's, let's start at sort of the fundamentals. You, people right. need to understand what they're looking for. Um, taking something like snapshot data uh, and integrating it into um, other on-chain data sets gives people an idea of what's happening with votes next to actual transactions. That's the type of stuff that, um, that helps people do things. I, you know, I'm, I, we don't do a lot with, with off-chain, but it um, depends on what your use case is. I'm always more curious to see what people do when they take our on-chain data. Because I've seen people try to write algorithms where they say, uh, here's the on-chain data. If this happens, then this, you know, then it will feed into an off an off-chain data pipeline or, or product that'll just say, okay, now we need to rewrite the smart contract. And I think that's where it's going. Um, when you, Because then you could see the on-chain events and then you could recycle them to off-chain activities which translate to more on-chain events. So we don't play that much in that world. Um, this is not our business, but it's interesting to see what happens when you sort of take uh, our data products and then Oracle and, and, and I've seen a lot of awesome hackathon projects that just this, this, is, this is what ends up coming out is, is a hybrid of both where, where both are used. Any final thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just reiterate, like say you have um, a network incident, right? And, but you know, you have actual real time data from a bunch of your nodes that say that their memory usage spiked. Now you have something like, like let's, like it's your solution basically, right? Mm -hmm. The solution to the problem on re in real time. Yeah. So um, I think that's very powerful, a very powerful tool, this correlation. Love it. TVL is dead. Something else is coming along. We'll find out next bull market. <laughs> Eric, Dave, Mariana, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys.